Walter well, Longo, welcome back to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. And would you believe 10 years since we probably sat in this very same laboratory here at USC and had our first conversation about human longevity? I was a musician and I just thought that aging, I don't know, when I was 19 years old, I thought that aging was the greatest thing and understanding aging and longevity was the greatest thing. So I just switched from music, from jazz performance to uh, to biogerontology, even when back then there was no biogerontology field, and and uh, you know I, I just uh, thought also there was the foundation for all the majority of diseases, right? So uh, why study each individual disease? Is better to understand the fundamental changes that occur with aging that give rise or, or set up each cell type to give you specific diseases. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't feel like a decade ago. No, not at all. I would have said you know maybe five. Yeah, so great, you know, we're, we're still going. And how are things going? You're telling me you're busy. Things are, are going well, and I, I think we're very happy about uh, the lots of results in a lots of uh, different arenas, both aging and, and cancer and diabetes and, uh, and uh, both the longevity diet and the fasting making diet. I think we're, we're moving forward and, and beginning to show that it works in the, the clinical setting and, and especially in the randomized the clinical trial setting. Well, I want to talk to you more about those. Uh, just big picture to start with. If you look back over the last decade, what have you learned? Maybe something you didn't fully understand 10 years ago that's made a, a really significant impact on you over the last few years in terms of your science and your goals? Yeah, 10 years is a lot for, for uh, our world. Um, so for sure, if we think about the genetics of aging, you were involved in covering the, the Larons, the, the, the subject, these little people that have growth hormone defic receptor deficiency. And so now uh, I think we are getting closer to um, you know showing that the last component, which was heart, uh, is also protected or this mutation that are protecting clearly against diabetes, against cancer, against cognitive decline. Uh, people suspected that yes, maybe you, you're protected against those, but you get more cardiovascular disease. And so and I, now we're very close to showing that's not the case, um, which you know makes it a very, very interesting uh, drug target or, or nutritional target to uh, prevent diseases, slow down the aging process. And, and so we're very happy about that and of course that connects with you know, 30 years of research from lots of different labs right looking at growth hormone igf1 and also some of the original discoveries in our lab in the lab of cynthia canyon and others about igf1 and, and growth growth pathways like taurus cyskinase so that's that's very good at the um, at the genetics level maybe you could uh, just explain a little bit of the background there for anyone who hasn't um, seen our podcasts before. Yes, yeah. I, I went on a trip with you to Ecuador to yeah. meet the little people, as you call them, people with Laron syndrome that uh, have a, a faulty receptor, which means they can't utilize IGF-1. What was the, that was a big breakthrough for you when you discovered this very small community of, of people and you were almost able to put pieces together in the jigsaw that explained some of the research you'd already been doing. Right, so the, and the research from, from my lab um, 30 years ago showed that the mute, if you take a unicellular organism and you mutate all its genes, the one gene that makes it live the longest, the mutation that live, makes it live the longest, is in a growth pathway. And so these mutants live three times longer, but they were also dwarf. Uh, so the cell is much smaller than normal. And um, yeah, so th then John Kapchik and Andre Barki showed this in mice. The mice that have growth hormone or growth hormone receptor deficient, so the, the receptor is what responds to the growth hormone. Or, uh, so it gets activated by the growth hormone. And so uh, and they, they shown in mice that these have actually the record longevity extension in a mammal, right? So yeah, so then connecting the, the, the dwarf yeast and the dwarf mice, then there was obvious to look at the, at the dwarf people or the little people, we don't call them dwarf, um, and, uh, and that's when you came around, I think right when we were about to publish or we just had published the first results on diabetes and cancer, just like the mice, 
these little people that have uh, a deficiency in the receptor of the growth hormone, um, they, were, they rarely develop cancer, rarely de develop uh, diabetes. And so at the time, first of all, the criticism was probably not real. Um, and then because the numbers are quite small, aren't they? It's about 100 people. It's about 350 in the world, and it's 100 in Ecuador. And so, uh, yeah, the, 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 the skepticism was there. And um, so eventually, then Zvilaron in, in, uh, in the Middle East and, and Europe showed something very similar with surveys that he was uh, doing on 350 people and cancer. And, uh, but also the parallel with the mice, um, uh, very similar effects, right? And cognition, so, you know, l losing learning and memories, ability. Um, we uh, uh, clearly showed that you, here, we actually brought him to Los Angeles a few years ago, and we showed that with what's called functional MRIs, that they had a, a cognitive performance that was more similar to people much younger than they were, right? So actually, I was here that very week, and you, you had a little party outside this building. Oh, that's right. You were, yeah, you were here for that too. Yeah, ex exactly. So, so yeah, uh, and then of course the the the, the, cr the last criticism, the big one, uh, since it's been twelve years since the original papers, was well, maybe they get more cardiovascular disease, and so then yeah, and of course, uh, if you're protected from diabetes, cancer, and cognitive decline, but you get more cardiovascular disease, you got a problem. And, and now it turns out that, if anything, they seem to be protected from cardiovascular disease. I, I don't go into the details because we haven't published that yet. But certainly, uh, good news now, we brought a cardiologist uh, uh, down to, uh, to Ecuador, and we spent a lot of time with Ecuadorian cardio cardiologists doing all kinds of tests. And, uh, and we also brought him here and did tests here on, on, uh, um, by cardiologists here at USC. And so the, the data in general confirms that they do not have uh, increased cardiovascular risk factor, nor do they have uh, increased any evidence of increased uh, cardiovascular disease. But what was interesting to me about that community is that they might well be resistant, if you want to use that word, to, to getting cardiovascular disease, getting diabetes, and the killer diseases of, of old age. They, did, they don't live exceptionally long, and they weren't a particularly happy community of, of people. They, they didn't want to be small. So it was right. almost the, while you might see some benefits of having low IGF-1, for them it wasn't a benefit, it was a major, major hindrance to their lifestyle. Yeah, of course, right. So they're born with the mutation, right? So nobody uh, is uh, proposing that people should be small so that they can, uh, uh, they can live longer and healthier. The point was to uh, identify the, the genes that can have that effect. And then, of course, allow people to grow to a normal uh, height and size, and then intervene at that point, right? So, with drugs or, or with with nutrition, they can control the genes, they control the aging process, right? So, yeah. So, and, and also we have other mutations that, even in simple organisms, that do not affect growth, right? So we already know that you can intervene in other ways. So, the, 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 what's what we call the protein pathway it's at the center of growth and longevity. But then on the other side, we have the sugar pathway. And the sugar pathway does, is not at the center of growth, just longevity, right? So then, then yes, uh, we, we, and this is why we've been, then the, the other big uh, side of what we work on is, is uh, fasting and fasting mimicking diets and, and, and uh, what's called the longevity diet. And so these are, um, are interventions that are controlling the genes that control the aging process, and sure enough, now we're we uh, having uh, more and more evidence that uh, we, we we cannot do a lifelong study, human study like we did for uh, the Larons of Ecuador, because of course uh, they were born with a mutation, and we can see how long did they live, and um, uh, but we can do risk factor studies, and we can do also biological age studies where we uh, where we look at you know how biologically young is someone when they do these dietary interventions or not. You know. And we'll continue my conversation with Professor Longo in just a moment. But first I'd like to thank Timeline Nutrition for supporting this episode of Llama, the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. Timeline make Mitopure, which is a highly pure form of urolithin A, the gut metabolite that's been clinically shown to energise cells from within. The ageing process affects our cells much earlier than you might think. 
It leads to a slower metabolism, lower energy and weaker muscles. But the evidence shows there's something we can do about it. Mitopure, which is generally regarded as safe by the US Food and Drug Administration, boosts the health of our mitochondria, the battery packs of our cells, and improves our muscle strength. Now, I want to do everything I can to stay strong and agile as I grow older. I'd like to continue doing what I enjoy doing, like a morning hike, for many years to come. I've been following this nutritional supplement since before it went on the market and using it myself, buying it from Timeline, from when it was first available. For this podcast, I've interviewed many of the leading researchers who, for more than a decade, have been unravelling the mechanisms involved in this aspect of nutrition. And the published science is compelling. If you'd like to join me on this journey towards a long and healthy life, Timeline is offering 10% off your first order. Go to timelinenutrition.com slash llama and use the code llama, that's L-L-A-M-A, to get 10% off your order. The link is also in our show notes. Go to timelinenutrition.com slash llama. So in that first conversation 10 years ago, in this laboratory, you were just about to, and you were preparing to do your first clinical trial involving human beings to look at the feasibility and, and the safety of the, the fasting mimicking diet that you just mentioned. And full disclosure here, I was one of the participants, that one of the first 19 That's right. in that trial. And I think eventually you had about 100 people in it. And we had 100 for that. And then, and then um, I think that the rest of it worked better than we would have expected. So it went all the way to cancer patients, diabetes patients, and every uh, trial thus far done independently of us, meaning that it was run by oncologists at University of Leiden, University of Heidelberg, uh, University of Milan, and, um, and, and so patients, for example, cancer patients, breast cancer patients that received uh, uh, cycles of the fasting making diet together with chemotherapy, they were much less likely to be resistant to chemotherapy. And in fact, the, in the Leiden trial with 125 patients, the, pa the patients that did uh, at least half of the cycles of the chemotherapy with the fasting making diet were five times less likely to be resistant uh, to the chemotherapy than, um, than if they did the, the regular diet. Right? That's so, quite a remarkable figure. Yeah, it, it, it's very impressive, uh, and so, I mean, it's a good start when you, when you do the first large clinical trial and you see these kinds of uh, changes. And, uh, and the interesting thing, um, I think that, that this happened in spite of the lo relatively low compliance. So uh, what happened in the trial was that they, we did not have dedicated, because we didn't run it, and so they just had the, the typical nutritionist dietitian that has been trained to think that a cancer patient should eat more. And, uh, and so we suspect that, um, and we see this all the time, that, that someone has been trained to tell a patient to eat more. If they're exposed to a trial, they may not be as, uh, as uh, encouraging to patients, right? But in spite of that, and in spite of the low compliance, it still worked, you know, which I, I thought it was remarkable. Uh, so almost everybody completed one cycle, but then it went down to 50% of two cycles of the fasting making diet, and then down to 35% when it was four or more cycles, three or more cycles. Uh, and, and, and the reason now we, the, the trial at the University of Milan, the, the National Cancer Institute in Milan, suggests, as we have shown for mice, that the reason for that may be that um, the T cells, the immune system, is now recognizing uh, the cancer cell. Uh, so the, 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 the fasting mimicking diet is making the cells much more recognizable by the immune system. So then all you need is that to happen once the cancer becomes an antigen for, for the immune system, then it doesn't really matter if you keep doing it, right? Uh, so that's what's interesting. And now we and, and a number of other labs have shown uh, these effects with or without immunotherapy. So if you do, it, so if you do, if you do chemo plus a fasting mimicking diet, it seems to in, uh, stimulate immunotherapy-like effects. If you, do the, uh, if you remove the chemo and you do the fasting making diet plus immunotherapy, now the immunotherapy works a lot better or, or better. Yeah. So, so yeah, so the cancer was very positive. And the other one, even more positive and more solid than the cancer has been the diabetes now, because the diabetes now 
uh, this is the, um, the third trial. One is published and two are not yet published with either uh, diabetes or, or, or prediabetes, and they're all showing very clear effects on, on A1C. Um, and uh, for example, Heidelberg published a randomized trial when they had five days a month they took diabetic, diabetic patients. They did uh, um, uh, six cycles of the fasting making diet once a month for six months. And then they compared it to six cycles of a Mediterranean diet for five days, once a month for six months. And those that had the Mediterranean diet cycles, nothing happened at all. And those that were on the FMD, uh, five cy six cycles, there was a uh, major drop in insulin resistance. And then I think it was about a sevenfold uh, uh, higher reduction in drug use than with the drug in the drug group alone, right? So they were right. s seven times more likely to reduce drug use if they're diabetic if they're do combining the drugs with the fasting making diet than if they were doing the the drugs alone right so yes that was very impressive and now there's another one uh, several additional trials that are coming out uh that are going to show same uh, same and result. you're also looking at alzheimer's in relation to the diet we're also looking at alzheimer's so we publish on the feasibility of the first uh, i think 20 30 patients together with the mouse so in mice it worked very well but um, also, it was, it was nice, at least that's all we know thus far, to see that Alzheimer's patients, which are much older, we, we develop a special um, diet for Alzheimer's patients. And it, it is the theory that, that the diet can help with the progression of the disease. This isn't a, a cure for Alzheimer's, but this is something that perhaps uh, softens some of the symptoms? We don't, I mean, obviously we don't know what it is uh, yet, uh, but, but in mice uh, um, and in lots of different models, let's say, when we did, let's say, pancreatic damage, gut damage, and, you know, damage to lots of different uh, systems, blood, uh, we actually repair, right? So we, we, in lots of these, like, for example, we, we, we damaged the pancreas in a mouse, and then they don't make insulin anymore. And then we start the fasting making diet, and you probably remember this, uh, and the, the, the pancreas, uh, there is a reprogramming of the pancreas that involves Yamanaka factors, by the way, right? So the, the cell is now going to a more embryonic-like state. And, and then it transitions to the state, and then starts making insulin again. So then we now know this for multiple systems. Does it happen in the brain? We don't know. So could it actually, the brain become younger, and repair itself. Uh, well, I don't know, it's science fiction right now, but, but certainly in the mouse seems to be happening or certainly the slowing of the cognitive decline is happening. Uh, now, how much of that is rejuvenation versus slowing down in the brain, we don't know. Uh, but, uh, but sometimes we, we start with, you know, mice have already developed plaques and tangles and, and then we act and, and it seems to still work. So, so then they're suggesting that some, some of the effects, at least in mice, is, is making them better and not just slowing down the progression. So let's talk about the diet itself. And I remember that clinical trial, little white boxes that are set out, day one, two, three, four, five. And I subsequently did the diet several times over a period of years. What have you learned over the many, many years now that people around the world have been using this diet? Clearly you have a lot of data. In terms of people's tolerance of the diet, the likelihood to want to do it again and again and again. I, I found it quite repetitive, but I, I'm just curious in terms of what you've learned through people's responses to it. Uh, the, um, well, I think that in general we tell, we tell people that um, maybe sh they should do it when they need to do it and not just you know, all the time. And so probably most people will have to do it, say, once every four months. And it's five days, right? So uh, I think even if it is repetitive, uh, five days every four months, or and you know, and some people slip and maybe do it every six months. Um, I think it's even hard to remember what you ate, you know, for those five days six months ago, right? So I I don't think that that's that's an issue, uh, much more an issue in a cancer patient that might have to do it every three weeks, uh, with the chemo or with the radiotherapy or with the immunotherapy, et cetera, et cetera. So that that's not an issue. I mean, I think that um, um, I, uh, I see that it's if people realize the benefits that they can have, the, uh, 
they don't mind doing it and keep doing it. And I see that we saw that they have an easier time doing it as they were used to it. Um, but also, I think that there is a lot of mentality, um, regulatory mentality. I think that is FDA driven, uh, which is good and bad. I mean, it's good. Why? Because obviously you want to regulate things. You don't want to improvise. But it's also, I, I mean, I'm thinking that the pharmaceutical influence is such that um, that there is not really a careful alternative for things, right? So basically, the idea is you cannot say anything. You cannot even mention a disease, right? Somebody told me, uh, some of the lawyers told me that I wasn't even able to describe, but that I shouldn't even describe our clinical trials that we're running an independent hospital because I'm a founder of a company. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, so I think that um, it's, um, it's very hard to, um, unless something, even it's a food, it's very hard to explain to people what it can do, right? So I could tell you about the diabetes trial, but, uh, but nobody can really know about that unless they go and read the, uh, read the literature. So I think at some point the regulation should, should just be careful as it is right now, but also allow for um, a more, uh, op uh, allow patients to have more options, right? It's not all about drugs. Yes, you may need drugs, or, or you may need drugs plus the diet, or you may need drug plus a product that is based on food, you know? And th that's, uh, that's what I hope is, is gonna happen, just to get people much more, and doctors, and doctors, by the way, right? More in tune with this, uh, having this in the toolkit, right? Did that hasn't happened yet? And I think a lot of it is because of regulatory sciences. You know? And just to explain the background here, you mentioned being the founder of the company, there is a, a commercial company that is selling this product around the world. Right. This is presumably a question that you get asked a lot, and I know because you've explained to me in the past that any profits, any money that you potentially could make, in fact, you are putting that money into a non-profit organization. Yeah, not just the potentially, you know, the one that I will make right now, they're all given to the, the charity and, and universities. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I don't, I, I I, I should have a consulting uh, fee, but I don't get it. You know, this is given to charity, right? So, so I, I thought it was important to, to not say, oh, one day, you know, but it was important to also say, uh, right now I'm giving it up. And, and so anybody can come and check it. And um, yeah, so I, I, I just think that, that I thought that was very important. The shares, I cannot use the, the, any of the, the, you know, if the company was sold or if it becomes public. I'm not, uh, I will not use the, the, the income or sell the shares. I mean, I can sell it to give it to the, char to the charities, uh, but not, not to pocket anything. So I, I make it exactly negative, you know, because sometimes I lose money out of, uh, out of this, right? Just like my books, also my book uh, <laughs> income, all 100% goes to, uh, to the foundation. The foundation, in fact, I don't even own my books anymore. It's, they're owned by the foundation. And uh, you know, and the foundation bought in Los Angeles. Now we have three in uh, in in Italy. This is create, create create cures. cures. Yeah, create cures. And uh, you know, so it's like uh, we're seeing thousands of patients a year with cancer, with diabetes, and and, and you know, also seeing people. They're seeing people. The, the clinical team um, uh, with that with a pay, right? So if you cannot pay, if you can show that you cannot pay, they, they're treated for free. Yeah. You obviously feel, and just from what you've been saying, a, a certain weight of responsibility. When, when you're talking, when you're doing interviews like this and many other interviews that you do, the books that you write, the papers that you write, a responsibility because you are something of a, a rock star. You, I know you wanted to be a rock star once upon a time, but you're a rock star in the field of, of longevity and people listen to what you say. And I, I just wonder to what extent that weighs on you in terms of responsibility to, to talk accurately and especially not to give people false hope. Yeah, it goes both ways, right? I, I, and that's the hardest part. Not giving false hopes is easy. Don't say anything, right? What's not easy is to say, okay, I want to give you, you know, some hope, right? And, and so that's a harder part, right? So how do you do that without upsetting the oncologist and neurologist? And that's what we've been navigating, and that's the hardest part. So it's, I don't think it's a responsibility, more it's like, I feel like, um, you know, if I had that problem, I would probably want 
somebody to say, I don't want to give you quackery, you know, I don't want to give you crazy stuff, I don't want to give you unsafe stuff. But if somebody just told you that you got two, two years to live, like we have glioma patients almost every day that contact, right? Glioblastoma, you get, you're in trouble, right? And so I don't accept anymore, and it took me many years to develop this, this courage, but I don't accept anymore the explanation of the oncologist, you're gonna die. It's like, no, we have people that have not died, right? We have people with advanced stage, and we had just published, you know, Vernieri just published on five cases, advanced stage um, breast cancer, uh, um, pancreatic, colon, and, uh, and, the, and the title in the European Journal of Cancer is said exceptional responses, right? FMD, fasting making that together with the standard of care, right? So, so now I think the, the more than responsibility, we feel like we have to say, hey, you know, hey, it may not work, but it may work, right? So to work with your oncologist, let's form a team, work with the foundation, and let's see how far we can do this, you know? So yeah, that's, that's a hard part, to tell people, oh, you know, I cannot tell you, this is what we used to do. And, uh, and then at a certain point, we, we felt like, come on, now we have, you know, 10 clinical trials, hundreds of papers in animals. I mean, at what point are you gonna, you know, at least say there is a chance, uh, you know, we don't wanna give you false hopes, but also we, we don't wanna not tell you what we know, right? So we know what we know in the clinical trials have results and you should be aware of it and you should have professionals to get working with your oncologist unless the oncologist refuses and sometimes that happens and uh, but even then we still help them and we say okay you're gonna have to get it approved by your oncologist or find another oncologist we cannot override the oncologist or they cannot override the oncologist but uh, that's the way it, we've been doing it with thousands of patients all over the world and you know, so far we haven't got a single complaint. So I think we're probably doing a, right. a pretty good job. I don't hope, I hope it doesn't start now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more about diet and, and food. And I, I guess another question that you get frequently is, well, okay, so you've got this five day regime that people might do every three or four months. What about the in-between times? And I, I know a lot of people gravitate towards, and, and I have, time-restricted eating. And that's essentially watching the clock in terms of how many hours you fast for, and for most people that's, that's overnight, and, uh, and what the optimum number is in terms of, of fasting hours. How have your thoughts on that developed, and, uh, and where are you now on those in-between times? Not only the, the regime that you follow, but what we eat. Yeah, so as you know, I base everything on five pillars, uh, and uh, we can list them if you want, or, or, or people can go look, look it up in the book, but you know, epidemiological data, clinical trials, basic research, centenarian studies, and complex systems, right? So, so we, we feel that this idea, this old idea, I just you know, pick epidemiological studies, for example, studies of populations, it's not enough. It's great, I mean, it's one of our big pillars, but it's not sufficient. So you want to have a common denominator effect, right? And so if you look at everything, you get, and as I used to say, and I keep saying it, 12 to 13 hours of fasting, right? 12 to 13 hours are now combining safety, high, high safety. It's just hard to find a doctor that'll tell you 12 hours of fasting per night is gonna be bad for you. Or a paper, or anything, in any pillar, right? And that's really, first, do no harm. It's really rule number one. And that's uh, pretty easy to do. Pretty if easy you, to you do. Think you, you finish eating at 6 p.m., and you get up at 6 a.m., well, there's your 12 hours. Yeah, exactly. But people don't do that anymore. People, in part because this idea is still in the back of people's mind that you should eat five, six times a day. And so these were bad ideas that were given to the world some years ago. But a lot of people still have this in the back of uh, their head. And so, you know, now Sachin Panda and others have shown that people go for 15 hours a day on average, right, I I in America and probably in Europe. So, so 15 yeah, so then hours of, of eating. 15 hours of eating, yeah, 15 hours of eating. So now you shorten it from 15 to 12, that's already a big deal, right? So lots of uh, such uh, studies are showing, say, going from 15 to 11, but you know, some people are probably doing 12 and some people are doing 11, uh, 13 hours of fasting, right? 12 to 13 hours of fasting. But, but I would say in, w in that range, um, I think that that's where Sachin and I meet, right? Because he, he may say 13 or 14, I say 12 to 13. Uh, and, you know, so let's say 13 seems to be a good compromise for those that are like 
gun ho right? The ones that are say, oh, I gotta do more. Exactly. And yeah. in, fa in fact, he says for some people up to 16. So th that's the area that 12 to 16 is the area of. Yeah, but difference. I will argue, and as I have always argued, don't go to 16 unless it's for a short period, right? right. And, and, and why? Well, because gallstone formation, gallbladder operation, and most people that do 16 hours, they have to skip breakfast. And skipping breakfast, now there's meta-analysis on that. It's just bad for you, right? It's bad for you. And now, in fact, I wrote a little introductory article to uh, three articles that just came out in Cell Metabolism and other journals. And they're showing if you skip breakfast and you start eating at 12 instead of 8, uh, your uh, energy expenditure uh, re is reduced and you're more hungry, right? Hunger goes up and energy expenditure goes down. So now we're starting to have clinical explanation, not just epidemiological. Now you have two pillars, both of which are saying, don't skip breakfast. Right? Um, when you say skip breakfast, what is your definition of skipping breakfast? Is it well, not eating within an hour of getting out of bed? Or no, what's it, the it's, time frame? It's, uh, let's say most people will have lunch and not breakfast. So you may have black coffee for, for breakfast. That's not breakfast. Right? So, and, and some studies have gone into looking at calories. But let's say in general, you know, if people say, I don't have breakfast. Um, it means nothing till lunchtime for most people. Yeah, right. so it means that you have dinner and then you have lunch, right? And, so, and a lot of people were under the impression that, oh, well, it, you know, I'm skipping breakfast, so it's good for me, I eat less, and it's healthy for me. Well, that's not the case, right? Well, you could argue, and people argue all day long, but when you have a pillar, a central pillar, like epidemiology, keep telling you that people that skip breakfast live shorter, more cardiovascular disease, potentially more cancer, don't mess with it, right? It's not a good start. It, now, could there be an explanation that people uh, that skip breakfast? Usually epidemiologists adjust, right? So they have adjustments for this. But let's say even if they didn't catch the right adjustment, uh, still, that's not a good start, right? Uh, you want things that are associated with a longer lifespan and not a shorter lifespan and less cardiovascular disease and not more. So I can uh, see people thinking and, and applying what you just said to their own lifestyle and thinking, well, I is this okay for me? So I'll, I'll tell you what I do. Tell me if it kind of fits in with your yep. way of thinking. So tr try to finish eating by 6 p.m. thereabouts, which is quite easy to do and, and not snack during the evening. And get up at about 6 a.m. And the first thing I do is have coffee with a, a little splash of oat milk. So there's a, there's a few calories there. But then I get out and do my exercise and I go for a long hike for three and a half miles. And I like to do that on an empty stomach because I don't feel good doing that kind of exercise having had a, a normal breakfast, which for me is, is, is fruits and grains and it, it, it's a mostly carbohydrate breakfast. But I, so I do that when I get back, which is eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning. So there's roughly 14 or 15 hours between my 6 p.m. meal and my substantial breakfast meal. I've had a few calories in my coffee at, at 6 a.m. Where does that fall in compliance? Uh, is that leaving it too long or is it kind of okay because I did have some calories in my coffee? Nobody knows, right? No one knows. Uh, be, be, nobody knows. Uh, uh, so you're, you're now probably okay because it is breakfast. It's just a late breakfast happening, you know, 14 hours after your dinner and you had some calories in between, it probably is okay. And, and um, I would say probably the most of the data is based on people that have, say, 7 p.m. type of dinner, or, or and then no, maybe black coffee, and then noon. Uh, uh, that's probably, and even in the trials that I just described, they either you ate at 8 or you ate, start eating at 12. Right? right. So that was the, the sort of definition of breakfast keeping. You don't do anything until 12. Right. So in your case, because you have some calories and then you eat at 8 or 9, that's probably okay. Um, I find that, I mean, everyone's individual, and I kind of raise my example because everyone's individual, different lifestyles, different morning routines, children, school, work, you know, whatever people are doing. So it, it's difficult to generalize. But, but from my perspective, having a, a slightly later breakfast, so 8, 9, makes it easier to get through most of the day. Like as we speak now, mid-afternoon, I've had my 8 a.m. breakfast, I had half a banana at about 12 o'clock, and that'll be it till my evening meal. So it, it gives me the day, and I know this is the kind of practice that you have, I think, of, of pretty much having a, a second mini fast during the middle of the day. Right. Yeah, so I, me and lots of patients that we follow at the clinics, um, so that seems to work very well. Now we started a large trial in, in southern Italy, 500 patients, where we're applying that. 
Um, so yeah, so we think that having this, uh, uh, I have coffee for lunch uh, five days a week. I don't do it seven days a week. And it's also trying to play with, uh, with the understanding of um, maybe some of these uh, adaptive mechanisms that um, you, know, you don't want the, the body to uh, necessarily abandon the lunch um, component. And so that's why, and this is hypothetical. We haven't never tested it. Now we're going to start testing it. But we, to reduce the risk, we'd rather have both, right? So have your week has lunches and no lunches. So your brain is now adjusted to both, right? So for example, I didn't have lunch today, and I'm, I don't care if I have lunch or not. Uh, so I can have it because in the weekend I'm used to have it, and I don't have it during the uh, week. Uh, so I think it's a good way to go, rather than, than skipping even lunch, because I'm afraid that eventually we're going to find out people that always keep lunch have the same problem that the breakfast skippers, right? Because keto body, keto body actually start going high, higher, not high, higher even if you do this in, within the fast. So uh, I don't like that. I don't like to, these spikes of keto, ketogenesis and back down. Uh, I'm afraid that you know eventually we're going to see problems with with people that do this yo-yo ketogenesis, and um, and that's why I, I you know I, I like to avoid any potential problem, not any problem that we know of, any problems that could arise 20 years from now, right? So uh, yeah, so the, our point, as you know, is getting can we get people to live to 110 healthy, and that's just a very complicated. Uh, lots of thinking it goes into it, and lots of sometimes not gaining the best effect that you could you get a little bit less but much safer right so yeah i could go 16 hours and i would see a lot more benefits i agree but do i want to risk it knowing what i know about epidemiology etc no i don't want to risk it i go 12 to 13 and yeah and and and, and that's a good compromise right and a final question on, on diet you have a mostly pescatarian diet so a little bit of fish uh, a couple of times a week getting your protein a, a relatively low protein diet protein from legumes beans peas that kind of thing yeah yeah so now as i'm getting uh, older i go to maybe three or four times a week fish and that's i think that the kind of age adjustments right the the, the legumes it's not just about protein, it's about also amino acid content, and I eat lots of legumes, and so I need maybe four days a week, of four meals a week of fish or, or seafood. Uh, somebody that might have lots of seeds, lots of uh, nuts, I mean, it depends on, on, me, on much, especially the essential amino acids you're getting from the uh, plant-based non-legume sources. Legumes just tend to have very low levels. And this way, legumes are probably number one in the in the um, uh, best food uh, uh, for longevity, at least based on this new uh, large Norwegian studies, uh, they, they came up number one. Uh, so the life expectancy increase in people that have high consumption of legume, but they also have downside, which is uh, because they have so little essential amino acids, they're very beneficial for certain things, but not so good for your muscle, maybe your bones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So this is why we're we're spending a lot of time and money now researching this balance, right? What is the balance at every age, biological age, now chronological age? Chronological age is irrelevant. Biological age. So if, what's your best diet for, your, for you, but also your biological age? And how you adjust it? And that's what we do at the clinic in this longevity programs. We have a team, molecular biologists, physician, you know, nutritionists, etc just adjusting right let's look at your muscle function your muscle mass uh, your igf1 insulin glucose ketone bodies yeah lots of different things and then we just uh, adjust uh, so that we 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 get you in the in the right spot you know you mentioned ketone bodies uh, what about keto diets which I, I suppose is the don't do it polar opposite of what you say yeah don't do it yeah so so keto diet don't do it uh, I mean, it may be okay uh, for some people, like I've seen it use like temporarily to get people from one state to another, uh, let's say to improve uh, glucose levels and could A1C. You, could, could you give me a one, two, three of why not do it? Yeah, uh, one, uh, don't do it because uh, um, studies, meta-analysis and, and or large studies, epidemiological studies show that you live shorter if you have a low carbohydrate diet. 
um, you know, two, it's very difficult uh, to maintain, and so most people will do it for a while, and uh, and then um, and then abandon it because it's just tough to to have uh, uh, to eat mostly fats, let's say. And uh, and three, also there is a lot of uh, at least some short-term um, uh, problems, right? So some clinical trials are showing that um, there are problems. I mean, there's, there's uh, benefits and problems both uh, described for um, ketogenic diets. Uh, so yeah, for when you start seeing problems like this in, in all, at all levels, I think it's much better to, uh, to, to, to not do it. And I always quote one study, I think it was Lancet or either JAMA or Lancet, it's better to have an 80% carbohydrate diet for longevity than having a, a low carb diet. Interesting. So 60%, I think 50 to 60 was ideal. Right. 80% uh, less years taken away than a, than a low carb diet. So you mentioned the goal is to try to extend our lifespan, uh, certainly extend our health span, the number of years that we enjoy life and we can have full health and uh, enjoy what we're doing. But lifespan to about 110, you, you think, is, is possible. I know you've been studying centenarians, uh, mostly in Italy. To learn, I guess, about their history and uh, the, the older ways of life, and is this correct to try to identify the benefits of some of those lifestyles and meld that with the modern day science and uh, the research that you do in laboratories like this? Yeah, so to lifespan and health span, I will add my word, youth span, right? And so I actually, I was very surprised years ago when I introduced this word because it didn't exist. And I always thought this is the most important word uh, that we don't have yet. It's like, uh, how long can you stay young? Uh, can we make somebody stay young from 40? Can we switch it to 60 or 70, right? Young in the sense that you can compete in a, in a soccer game or, a, or, or like Tom Brady in a football game. I was going to say, how, you, how do you define young? W well, we had in the paper, we described like, you know, have like maximum performance. It doesn't have to be record, right? But like marathon runners, right? They, they can still run at world record levels around 40 years of age, right? Uh, so that even a lot less than that would still be young. Um, but to answer the question about the centenarians, I think the centenarians have lived to 100, 100 years, right? So there are um, evidence of a hundred ability to make it for 100 years. And some of them ability to make it for 100 years healthy. And uh, yeah, so then talking to them is really, uh, yeah, it's an end of one, each one you talk to, but then you talk to 200 and you just had 200 examples of what did it take to get you there, right? And, and some of them get to 110. So yeah, so then I think you learn a lot about, um, for example, one of the things not surprisingly that we saw was that a lot of them had a very poor diet for the first 70, 80 years of life. And then they start, they move in a nursing home or they're moving with their with sons and daughters and they start eating a lot more. And that's exactly what the science would have predicted uh, will be ideal for you. So you're restricted, but you don't, you're no longer restricted, heavily restricted when you're 75, 80, 90. And the epidemiological data in our own work shows that if you're reporting a very low protein diet when you're 90, you're not doing so well. Right, so the person reporting a moderate uh, protein intake is doing much better than those reporting a low protein intake. Um, so, so yeah, I think that, that the centenarians are, are very important pillar and uh, you just have to be uh, realistic and so for example sometimes we realize that they are also genetically uh, predisposed right so it's not just a lifestyle it's this like Sardinia Calabria it's very clear yeah, there's families that were born with I always say you know to be Michael Phelps you yes you have to train and 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 and, and eat well etc cetera, etc cetera, but you also have to be born with the genetic uh, predisposition, the, the height, the arm length. Yeah, so I think that they're starting out already uh, as super, uh, super longevity uh, genetic makeup. And, uh, and then they're adding the lifestyle, the, ex the labor and the nutrition and all that. And that's how they make it to this world record. Yeah. Do you Enjoy, you must enjoy speaking to centenarians. I, I've spoken to a, a couple, at least for this podcast. And I have the same feeling when I come away from the conversation every time. It, it's, 
it nurtures my enthusiasm for, for doing this kind of work. Do you feel the same? I, yeah, I think that you, you, of course, we go to the centenarian for scientific and technical reasons, and every time we walk away, we walk away with a smile because of a story, because of uh, something they have experienced, the war, uh, and, and just uh, really remarkable. And, and some of these words that just stay in my head, you know. Um, and so, for example, the lady, I always talk about the lady, and maybe I already did it with you, but uh, in, in southern Italy, uh, where we asked her, so when you were, you know, uh, 40, 50, 60, uh, 60, how often did you eat red meat? And she turned to her niece and she didn't understand because she was from Calabria, Italy. And then she realized what we were asking and she smiles and said, yeah, I had red meat one time because we, we crashed her wedding. And so we, we are so poor that that's the only time in like 30 years that she, she had red meat, right? So, so we, here we are talking about thinking, asking epidemiological questions like oh, how many, how frequently did you have red meat? And the lady answering, never, right? Uh, uh, rarely. Uh, so so this, this is very interesting. And of course telling them how poor they were and what conditions they lived in for, for a long, long time. When you mentioned, uh, I talked about health span and, and life span, and you say yes. youth span. Youth span and ju juventology, right? Juventology. So, so I think that neither the word, the study, so we're in the school of gerontology, the most famous school of gerontology in the world, and one of the few schools of gerontology in the world. And so the study of aging, right? Gerontology, the study of aging. But I was very surprised that the study of youth was not there. So I always said, I'm much more interested in, in learning how to stay young then uh, why I get old, right? right? So it's two different things, right? So, yeah. so you've just used in the same sentence there, young and old. And uh, I've been having this debate recently about the use of the word old. It's almost always used in a negative sense. Uh, society looks at old as being decrepit, as on the decline, without any of the positive aspects of being old. And uh, you ask a child what their age is, they don't say I'm 10 years young, they say I'm 10 years old. So my point is that we're all old to a certain degree. Yeah. And I see getting old, whether it's 110 or 99, as a privilege and, and something that people in the longevity space should be perhaps cheering a little bit more than society does. Um, yes, I, I, I don't have a problem with, with old. Um, I think that, um, so yeah, my, mine uh, is a view, it's a technical view on what's more interesting, the, the process of what keeps you young or what makes you old. But yeah, I think that I always say violins uh, um, age and they get better um, and, and wine ages and it gets better. Uh, so an old wine is, is uh, oftentimes better than a, than a young one. And yeah, so there is nothing wrong with the word old, especially like you say, it's already used when you're three. Yeah. And, uh, and so, um, yeah, so then the, the, the stigma of, of, of the word or associated with the word should, should go away. But and, and, but and I bet a lot of those centenarians that you speak to, by and large, they are happy people. They're not depressed the fact that they are 100 plus years old. Generally, everything is great in their world. Uh, that's when you only talk to two or three, right? Okay. When you talk to two or three hundred, uh, a lot of them are like Emma Morano, the, the oldest person in the world, uh, when I was uh, followed there in the last five years of her life. Was that the famous lady for eating eggs? Eggs in, in steak, in uh, raw meat every right. day. And uh, she's complaining all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, so very isolated and only dealt with a few people. Yeah, so I, you always get both, you know, and, okay. and this is also coming out of the demography uh, studies. The demographers, demographers will say, you get the two personalities. You get the one you just described, uh, nothing can kill them. And then you get the ones that are like tough, tough warriors, and like Emma Morano. And they'll, they'll just, they don't care, you know, they'll just keep on going. And, uh, and they're not necessarily pleasant to be around and they, uh, uh, they don't have a lot of friends, but they just keep on going. And, and, and uh, yeah, so it's interesting, right, that these two persons. So I always say, yes, of course, if you can have a lot of social interactions and, and a happy life, uh, have that. But don't feel like, um, you know, if you don't have it, that uh, you're doomed and, and you're going to 
uh, die at 72. Uh, so uh, you're fine. You can you can do well and you can keep on going and, and live live a long life. Yeah. So we had our first conversation 10 years ago. If we meet again in this laboratory or somewhere else in 10 years' time, 2033, I will be 71 years old. You, I think I'm correct in saying, will be 65. 65, yeah. What do you think we'll be talking about as it relates to this longevity space? I hope we'll be talking about the um, nutrition and uh, fasting, mimicking diets, etc. Being in the teams, right? Uh, having changed the way we keep people healthy and long-lived. And having, um, I just wrote an article for the Milken Institute, and, uh, and I, I was quoting, I think, uh, someone, Dana Goldman here from USC and others, and saying that uh, the savings in the next uh, 50, year, uh, 50 years, I think it was, is $7 trillion. Right? And that's probably way underestimated, way underestimated. Uh, if we think that the impact of really having the teams and the nutrition and the lifestyle and the exercise and the great medicine and trying to keep people away from the expensive interventions. I think that, you know, the, the, that's what I hope we'll be um, looking at, right? Uh, so we'll look around and say, you remember 10 years ago, people went to the doctor once a year to get drugs. And now look around, there's teams that practice a very different preventive ju juventology, right? Uh, or preventive gerontology, right? And, and it's no longer just the doctor, it's the doctor, the molecular biologist, the nutritionist, the psychologist, you know, the, the kinesiologist working in a team to say, okay, and the artificial intelligence people, right? Working in a team and the, the, the technologies, the, the apparatus, uh, that that um, is going to be necessary, the, the, the portable technology that's going to be necessary to not having to go to the hospital or to the doctor. So, yeah, we want to just keep people away from the hospital, right? That's going to be our, our, our goal. And, uh, yeah, I, I sincerely, it's doable now, right? It's doable now. We already have the data. It, it is not some idea that, that uh, it's just a matter of can we influence enough the system to allow this because a lot of people don't want to see this happening, right? There's a lot of money going around into, uh, into the system that sells bad food, bad drugs, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, well, there are a lot of good drugs, right? They're right. not attacking the, the pharmaceutical companies. I'm saying we just need to take drugs when drugs are needed right. and not take drugs just because, oh, yeah, you're diabetic. Well, let me load you up with drugs. Uh, yeah. So society has to be on board with this. It, it, it can't be just the scientists. Journalists are number one. Journalists, most important, journalists right? number one? Uh, journalists by far number one. The journalists have to make the decision that, you know, from now on, the, we're just going to talk about this revolution, right? Well, that's what I'm is trying to do, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about the revolution. Yeah, the doctor is great. The doctor should be part of the team. The doctor should also make the final decision. But the team assembles that complex intervention and applies it in as easy as, a, as possible of a manner to the patient. Less in, low invasiveness, maybe you have a continuous glucose monitor or a, or a ring or a blood pressure bracelet, whatever it is. So don't worry about it and don't need to come in. We're following you from the distance and maybe once every six months you come in and this is what we already do at the clinic. At the clinics. Uh, yeah, so I think that uh, the journalists are going to have to sort of push the system challenge the, the status quo and push the system of what's going on? Why can we save trillions of dollars? And this is, a, nobody's going to uh, argue with that. And yet, uh, and this is why I say in my article, in the 60s, over 10% of the U.S. population, the prevalence of, of, overweight, uh, of obesity uh, went over 10% in the 60s. In the 70s, went over uh, 20%. In the 80s, went over 30%. In the 90s, went over 40% and nobody did anything about it. This is crazy, right? And I, I, I contrasted with uh, COVID. And I said, you know, when COVID came around, it put everybody that you can, every journalist in the planet, all they talked about it was COVID. It's great, and it should even be more than that, right? Fine, preventive, preventing uh, viral and, and microbial diseases, extremely important. But in, in 2017 alone, 11 million people die of dietary 
uh, of, uh, preventable uh, causes of that, uh, preventable by dietary changes, and nobody talks about this, right? So uh, more podcast conversations like this, and perhaps I, sh uh, through your eyes, should be talking to decision makers, to politicians, people who can make things happen? Challenge them like you challenged the COVID. Uh, when, when the virus was spreading, the journalists went crazy and said, hey, what's going on? How are we going to deal with this? People are dying, right? It's just all over the news, all over the place. When 11 million people in one year die of bad food and too much food, okay, that's okay, you know, that's part of life. That's not, right? That's not part of life. This is not where we come from. We don't come from bad food and too much food. We come from, and we don't come from eating all the time. We come from a history of eating and then, you know, sometimes you fast, right? And, and sometimes you have poor food and sometimes you have rich food, meaning yeah, sometimes you might have had meat, but some, lots of th the, the other times you have, you know, whatever you can grab from your garden. You know, so A lot of work still to be done. Walter, it's always a pleasure. My pleasure. We'll continue talking. Thank you so much. You're welcome.